So happy new year, everyone. Thank you for coming to our uh, uh, new innovative discovery seminar. In new discovery. The first, we have that's the first one of the year. We have a real treat today, Erin Crowdy from the University of Delaware, and from Nemos, actually. She's going to start a new job in Nemos in next Wednesday? Um, February. In February. In February. Uh, is here to tell us about Genomics, which is a subject in which we have much to learn. So, uh, first, some housekeeping reminders. Please make sure that you sign in. Please uh, RSVP so that we can better prepare for the next session so that we have more food for everybody. So don't forget to RSVP. Uh, online participants, please keep the mic muted unless asking a question and keep video turned off. Use a chat feature in BlueJeans if you have technical questions. Our next seminar will be assembling and analyzing cohorts from electronic health records and example from the NICU, Vanil Goldstein, on January 22nd. And then, oh no, that's uh, January 15th. And then on January 22nd, what can be done about the cost of care for chronic disease and conditions by uh, Dr. Stanhope from Please see the full access, the full schedule, schedule on the access, uh, Accel website, and all our pre previous presentations are also, are also on our website, deccr.org, and uh, are recorded. So uh, I just want to uh, spend a few minutes to introduce Erin. Erin got her PhD in bioinformatics and system biology last December, 2015. Congratulations. No, Wednesday. Oh, that was Wednesday. No, I'm defending next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. Oh, this coming Wednesday. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, uh, good luck. I'm sure you have a good luck in the press. She has a Master of Science in Immunology and Molecular Biology from Miami uh, University in Oxford, Ohio, and a Bachelor of Science from Valparaiso University in Indiana. She also was recently a consultant at Sena. Spina Sana in Los Angeles to create a research community informatics network to integrate clinical and high throughput molecular omic data. Was a graduate assistant in the Department of Bioinformatics and System Biology at the University of Delaware. She uh, did her dis uh, dissertation with Cassie Wu from the University of Delaware and Dr. Andy Cohen from Demos on developing bioinformatics pipelines for human networks and whole genome sequence from clinical pediatric samples. Uh, she also worked with Dr. Sean Thompson, <coughs> who is, uh, with whom we work, on uh, metagenomic meta genome assembly. And I would love to learn what it was, metagenomic uh, And also, very impressive, she belongs to a group of several uh, inventors for two patents and has already a large number of people. So, and finally, she is one of the co investigators with Dr. Kolb and uh, Tim Donald of one of the big data grants that we have just awarded. So, thank you very much, Erin, uh, and congratulations today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation uh, to speak today. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about a team science project that we've been working on with, uh, between the University of Delaware and the Morris Children's Hospital. Um, I'd like to go ahead at this time and acknowledge um, grant funding from Delaware Embry and also from the, <coughs> the Leukemia Research Foundation of Delaware. I have no other um, relevant financial disclosures uh, for today. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about pediatric acute myeloid leukemia. I'm going to refer to it from now on as AML. Um, and I'm definitely going to focus on next generation sequencing or DNA sequencing. Um, certainly if you want to talk about any of the other omics, proteomics, those types of things, um, please see me afterwards. Um, so pediatric AML is considered a, a disease of the genome. Um, the reason why is because many, many genomic alterations are required for both disease onset and progression. It's characterized by dysregulation of signal transduction pathways and hemopoietic progenitors. This results in both the increased proliferation and survival of non-differentiated cells. You need two different types of genomic alterations. We often refer to type 1 mutations as those that alter <coughs> cell proliferation pathways, whereas type 2 mutations refer to um, genomic alterations that alter cell survival pathways. Pediatric AML is considered a fairly rare disease. There's only about 500 children a year that are diagnosed with pediatric AML. And despite maximally intensive therapy, survival is still only about 50 to 60 percent. 
And this is because of relapse. Most children actually relapse within one year after their first round of treatment. And this accounts for greater than 50% of all deaths in pediatric cancer cases. What's interesting about pediatric AML, when we look at the karyotype distribution, is that it's very diverse. There's not just one single type of karyotype that really defines this disease. And in fact, about 20% of children have a normal karyotype. And the reason why is because they have genomic alterations that are too small that to be detected by these traditional karyotype um, techniques. And this is really where genomic sequencing has really helped the field in pediatric AML. Because some of these are extremely important, such as the FLT3 IDT, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, in terms of understanding both disease progression and treatment options. The Children's Oncology Group is pioneering what's called a risk adaptive stratification system. They use basically three different types of um, measurements for this, cytogenetic markers, molecular analysis, such as FLT3, and minimal disease resistant. And it's really the combination of these different things that allow clinicians to better understand both treatment options and disease progression and chances for relapse. The project is funded by the National Cancer um, Institute. It's called TARGET, or Therapeutically Apical Research to Generate Effective Treatment. This data set is available to the research community, but you have to go through a fairly rigorous uh, submission process through dbGaP to gain access to the data. With the support of members of the Children's Oncology Group, um, primarily uh, Dr. Andy Cole from Nemours Children's Hospital, we were awarded access to this data set and we've been analyzing it now for almost two years. The experimental design was that from each child, um, the sample type was bone marrow, and the sample was collected at, diagnost at the diagnostic state, remission, and relapse. They did DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing, and this was done using next generation sequencing, which I'm going to talk just a little bit about. The DNA sequencing was either whole exome sequencing targeted exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, whereas on the RNA, they did RNA-seq, which is transcriptome sequencing and microRNA. Today, I'm mostly going to focus on the DNA sequencing, um, but we are very interested in doing what we're calling transomic or panomics integration, and that's certainly the future of where this project is headed to. What's interesting and I think is important to note is that at this stage, we really consider the remission sample as, a, as the way to be able to annotate between germline versus somatic mutation. But if you've been following the literature recently, you know that germline mutations, especially in AML, are now considered to be very important. And we're not just focused on somatic mutations any longer. So next generation sequencing. It's, it's been around for a little while, but it's, it's, it's just now finally gaining speed, I feel like, in the clinical field. This is really a high-throughput sequencing application. Um, you can do massively parallel sequencing of many, many DNA molecules at once. This is much different compared to the standard Sanger sequencing that we're probably all very familiar with. It does not require a priori knowledge or traditional cloning methods. So you do not have to design primers. You do not have to know the gene of interest. You do not have to know the location of the genomic alteration or the sequence of it. You can actually do this type of technology without having to have a priori knowledge, which is fantastic. It enables the sequencing of an individual's genome or transcriptome. And nowadays, we can pretty much sequence a human genome within 24 hours, which is pretty impressive. And it's about $1,000 for just the actual sequencing. But unfortunately, a primary limiting factor to next generation sequencing is the downstream bioinformatics. We generate massive amounts of data when we sequence a single individual's genome. And for this project, each single patient had their genome sequenced three different times. So this is a, what we call big data. The raw data for this project is 20 terabytes. This is highly compressed um, and on-process data. So it, it's been great because next generation sequencing has rapidly advanced the ability to detect genomic variants that are rare because, as I said before, a priori knowledge is not required. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with bioinformatics, it is an interdisciplinary field that develops methods and software tools for understanding biological data. Today I'm really going to focus on sequence analysis of genetic information, but bioinformatics is not just analyzing DNA sequence information. So that's not all bioinformaticians do. 
So just to give you kind of an overview of how this takes place, you have your patient, you're going to extract DNA. This could be saliva, blood, bone marrow, solid tumor. For this particular project, it was bone marrow. We're going to do a random fragmentation of that genomic DNA, and then we're going to sequence those small fragments. And in the end, what you get is a very large, flat text file with strings of about 50 to 150 nucleotides. So it's fragmented DNA. Those files are about 20 gigabytes, depending on the depth of sequencing that you've done. This is not a file that you can simply open up on your laptop or open up with Word and do Control F to find your choice. <laughs> you actually need to have a, what we call a high performance or supercomputer to be able to analyze this data. And for those of you that aren't aware of this, we actually have one of these right at University of Delaware. Um, with Dr. Kathy Wu, who's done a fantastic job of bringing this into the state of Delaware. Our high performance cluster um, consists over 600 nodes. Uh, we can actually handle this type of project because of this. We would not have been able to apply for this data without having access to this type of computer infrastructure. It, this particular project, we have about 800 unique patients. And as I said before, that's about 20 terabytes of raw compressed data which is basically just strings of letters. There's no meaning yet. It's just big data. There's no knowledge. Just 20 terabytes of raw data. What, what ideally you need to be able to do to analyze this type of data is you need to be able to run things in parallel. You don't want to start running patient number two waiting for patient number one to be analyzed. You want to be able to run everything in parallel. <coughs> Otherwise, it's going to take you about 10 years to analyze this type of data. The other thing that you need to be able to paralyze is when you're analyzing a single patient, some processes can be run in parallel. They're not dependent on each other. And this is really where we strive at University of Delaware, and we're able to do this type of analysis. So this is a typical workflow for analyzing next generation sequencing. It's not important that you can read every single one of these boxes. The importance here is that you understand that this is a complex process and it requires many steps and many algorithms. There is not a single algorithm or even a commercially available tool that can handle all of the data processing steps. You need to be able to use different things, combine them together appropriately, and oftentimes this is very relevant to the disease that you're studying. So if you're studying a rare Mendelian disease, the algorithms that you need to use are going to be very different from the algorithms that are used for studying um, pediatric um, AML. We've created start to end analysis for analyzing this type of data, and we've implemented quality checks at each step. We follow the um, government has put together a national working group to handle this type of data analysis, and we, we try to follow all of their guidelines in terms of QC steps that are required for analyzing clinical NGS data. We do leverage publicly available algorithms and databases and open source algorithms or open source platforms such as R Statistics. And this is one thing where I've seen a big change in the field is the acceptance of using these types of open source um, algorithms. It's no longer, oh, let's in-house just develop our own statistical pro programming language. It's really, it's really gained speed to use open source and to collaborate in big groups, which is fantastic. You really need to be able to detect multiple types of genomic variants, especially in pediatric AML. This is a very heterogeneous um, disease. It is characterized not only by differences in location of the genomic alterations, but the types of genomic alterations. So you really need to be able to have that diversity to be able to detect these various different types and bring that information together. I work on developing custom scripts and modules for prioritizing this type of data. As many of you who have analyzed this type of data may know, when you do this type of analysis, you find lots of differences. Between two healthy individuals, you will find lots of differences in their genomic sequencing. That does not mean all of those differences are related to some type of disease or some type of phenotype. And you really have to be able to separate those natural variants that occur that are not associated with disease versus those that are. We developed this in collaboration with clinical researchers, and I can't stress enough how important it is for bioinformaticians to work, um, I would say almost on a daily basis with clinicians. If you're in a room by yourself and you're developing something, if it can't be applied in an appropriate way in um, the clinical setting, it, it's not going to do anybody any good. And that, finally, we like to output what we call knowledge maps. We want to make the outputs of these types of analysis digestible by, by, by everybody, not just by somebody who has the skill sets to be at the command line. <laughs> 
So I just wanted to go over this because I think it's really important. For single nucleotide variants, what you start with is a reference genome. Currently today, HD19 <coughs> is considered the gold standard reference genome, and that's what we use. And as I said before, you fragment the DNA. So we have these short little stretches of DNA that are sequenced. You have to align those to the reference genome to start with. Once you align them to the reference genome, you're going to start to look for differences. And for this example, these are just single nucleotide variants. So it's just one single change in A, T, C, or G compared to the reference genome. Now you will find examples where those differences, such as highlighted in red, are very consistent through all of the reads that you sequence. Whereas you might have genetic variants, such as the green one, where it's not supported in every single read. Now this could be true. We have two copies of every gene, at least, unless the copy number variations are kind of compl complicating our understanding of, of how many copies of genes we have. But you could be a heterozygote. You could carry one of the alternative allele and one of the reference allele. This could also be a sequencing artifact due to a PCR error. So you have to be able to be able to distinguish between those types of things and use things like allelic proportions and allelic balance to understand whether or not you really think an allele <coughs> is real versus an artifact. For cancer, then, what we want to do is we want to be able to annotate germline versus somatic. <coughs> and so that's why we have the remission sample. So we're going to use the remission sample in this case study to annotate between what we think is a germline mutation and what we think is an actual true somatic mutation. So to start this project, we were given about 250 verified variants. These were verified in the patients. We knew that they existed and that we should be able to detect them with our methodology that we've been developing. I used two different algorithms, um, Shimmer and Mutec. Um, Mutec is by the Broad Institute and ultimately outcompeted Shimmer, and that's what we move forward with. For most patients, we were actually able to detect 100% of the verified, uh, verified um, single nucleotide variants. There were a few um, that we didn't quite detect all of them. As I said before, we're really concerned about QC at each step. I'm not going to go into this very much today, but it's really important if you're analyzing this type of data that you understand the limitations. So if you do not find a variant in your gene of interest, the first question you should ask yourself was, what's the depth of coverage for that gene? If you didn't have any reads, then you wouldn't find anything, but that doesn't mean that a variant does not exist. So these types of things we're constantly looking at. We're constantly cross-referencing databases. OK, here's my list of oncogenes. Here's my depth of coverage for each one of those. What I've expected to be able to find a variant in this was the coverage appropriate for a variant to be detected. So in summary, we detected and ranked about 40 additional single nucleotide variants compared to the original data analysis. These are high-confident variants. We use, I developed a custom algorithm. I'm not going to go into the math today, but if anybody would like to talk about it, I, I, I would love to talk about it after the presentation. Um, I use things such as confidence or the quality of the somatic <laughs> alteration, the effect of that single nucleotide variant. Is it actually causing a translational shift in the translated protein? Is it causing a premature stop codon? Is it altering a splice site? Or is it just located in an intron? Unfortunately, a lot of variants we are finding are located in, in introns, and these are very difficult to sort of understand the effect of them. So it's not that we're getting rid of those. We just filter and bend them differently. And that's another key that I, I think is really important to understand when you're developing these types of methodologies, is you want to keep all of that underlying <coughs> data. You don't want to have to go back through each and every time and readjust something because you think you filtered something out that was important. And that's why the high-performance computer cluster is absolutely necessary. We also look at things such as protein-protein interactions. So if we have a, a gene that we've ranked because of the location and the effect of the single nucleotide variant, but it's not known to be an oncogene, but it interacts with a known oncogene, we're going to score that fairly high because it's interacting with a known oncogene, even though it has not yet been described as an oncogene. And we're also going to use functional annotations, such as gene ontologies. Um, it's really great, the work, and especially what Kathy's group has been doing for ontologies. When you have controlled vernacular for this type of data, it really enhances the ability to collaborate and also to be able to work between different projects. So this is an example <clears throat> of what we would call a knowledge map or a prioritization. What you're looking at here are the genes that had a single nucleotide variant 
that were ranked as high. And you can see some of the classical ones, such as Pitt, NRAS, KRAS, um, some known oncogenes. We've also discovered quite a few new ones that were not um, previously reported. And you can start to gain an understanding of how they interact with each other. The different colors represent branches or concurrence of different singling pathways. So a lot of proteins actually do not just act in a single pathway. They actually play, have a role in many, many different pathways. And those are the types of things we're very interested in. From this, you can start to then do enrichment analysis. So from this, we stem cell growth factor, kit signaling, spliceosome, and PARP signaling were some of the highly enriched above background signaling transduction pathways that are being affected from the single nucleotide variants that we discovered for these children. With that said, we knew that we had missed some important genomic variants because they were not single nucleotide variants. They're different types of genomic variants. And one of them is in FLT3. FLT3 is a class 3 tyrosine kinase receptor, belongs to the class 3 tyrosine kinase receptor family. It is expressed in hemopoietic stem cells and progenitor cells. It's essential for stem cell development and differentiation. And activating mutations in FLT3 are the most common somatic mutations found in pediatric AML. The problem is, is that they're not always single nucleotide variants. In fact, the, an, an internal tandem duplication in exon 14 and 15 is one of the most common variants found in pediatric AML. But it would not be detected with, this, with the first pipeline that I showed you, which is why you have to be able to develop these types of things that can analyze and detect multiple different types of genomic alterations. Um, right here, I'm displaying a crystal structure of FLT3, and in yellow is the region that's affected by the FLT3 internal tannin duplication. It causes ligand-independent activation of the FLT3 receptor. The allelic ratio currently is calculated by Applied Biosystems Gene Scan Analysis software. This is a PCR-based method. It's approved by the FDA. If a child has a um, allelic ratio of greater than 0.4, so this is mut mutant compared to wild type, then the FDA has approved treatment with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. The limitation to this assay is that it can only detect this genomic variant, cannot detect any others. We know, though, that the co-occurrence of the FLT3 IDT with other mutations, such as the uh, um, NUP98 NSE translocation, is actually a better determination of um, disease um, re progression and also relapse. So we want to be able to not just detect one genomic um, variant at once, but we want to combine this with the single nucleotide um, variants. The original time this data was analyzed, they missed this in the next generation sequencing data. Um, but we knew that the patients had it based on this type of um, PCR-based method. So this is one of the ones that we really wanted to go after because it's directly related to treatment options. The strategy for indels, though, is much different compared to single nucleotide variants. When you align your read to the reference genome, because of this insertion, so an internal tandem duplication is just a fancy type of insertion. So when you have it at the on letter A at the bottom here, sorry, there's no pointer, um, the sample, so the bottom in the red here, <coughs> this is the, the sample genome. So this is the individual patient's genome. When the, when the DNA is fragmented, red represents that stretch of DNA. When you align this to the reference genome, this does not exist in the reference genome. So you have to be able to allow that type of alignment to take place, and you also have to allow that type of detection to take place. On the insertion side, when a patient has the yellow here, it's not going to be able to align to the genome because it doesn't exist in your reference genome. If you don't allow those reads to align to the genome, and you don't use an appropriate algorithm to detect those, these will be missed. And certainly that's what happened the first time that this data was analyzed. So we were able to actually detect the FLT3 IDT. We were the first ones to report it from the next generation sequencing data. Um, this has been a huge accomplishment for our teams here in Delaware, and we're very excited about this. There was one patient that we did not detect it in that we should have, um, and the reason is because of the size of this genomic variant was too large for the algorithm that was used. So we're actually in the process of enhancing this portion of the pipeline so we can make sure that we can, in fact, capture people that have them. The, the, the complication with this is that the length varies between patients. Some patients have a 75, some patients only have a 25 nucleotide insert, 
Whereas the one patient that we detected, the insert was over 100 base pairs. So in summary, we're really trying to focus on translating big data into clin clinical knowledge that affects treatment. This has certainly been the focus of this work and the focus of large, a lot of the projects moving forward. You have to be able to integrate different types of genomic variant data, especially when you're working on a disease such as pediatric AML that is not characterized by a single genetic alteration, and it's not, char it's not even characterized by a single misregulation of a single pathway. A systems biology approach can be <coughs> beneficial for ranking and prioritizing variants. As I said before, you're going to detect naturally a lots of differences between two healthy individuals. Now, when you start transitioning into looking at people who have a particular disease phenotype, you need to be able to screen out those that are not associated with the disease versus those that are. Bioinformatics pipelines should have QC at each step. This is absolutely essential, and oftentimes people just glance over this. And leveraging publicly available resources is a must. You, you should try to stay current with, pub, with databases that are available and algorithms and so forth so you're not reinventing the wheel and you're leveraging already knowledge that's, that's available. Unraveling the genetic differences between diagnosis and relapse state can help with treatment strategies, and this is where our main focus is moving forward in the future. And we are trying to incorporate um, other clinical lab data. Um, this has been one limitation of this particular data um, set, is that we don't have a lot of clinical lab data with this, but um, we, are trying to move, we are trying to gain access to that. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and acknowledge um, Dr. Kathy Wu and Dr. Andy Cole from Nemours Children's Hospital, um, Sohil, Sean, um, Carol, and Jennifer Whiffles for their support. Um, it's been great working with the Children's Oncology Group and their, their members. Their mission is to cure and prevent childhood and adolescent cancer through scientific discovery and compassionate care. So thank you for your time. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, that was ter uh, terrific, and I really want to learn, learn more. Um, how do you think this generation's uh, sequencing can be uh, applied to um, uh, larger populations where they're, they're, uh, they have um, uh, um, different kinds of, of, of genetic abnormalities. And a good example of that one, is one you're already familiar with to some extent is familial hypercholesterolemia. So it's a common disease, one, one in two, 250, some six, 1,600 mutations noted so far. One suspects there, there, there are more. People have more than one. Uh, they interact in, in complicated uh, 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 ways. But the downstream diagnosis is is uh, 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 downstream events are long in coming. You'd like to know how those relate to downstream uh, 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 events. Is it all a matter of the, the phenotype? Does that affect L LDL? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's more. How can we how can we use new new approaches to begin to get at some of these sort of issues? Yeah. So I think there are some great benefits and also limitations at the same time. So when you when you're not sure, when it's a little bit more of a fishing expedition, you know, you're not exactly sure what genes. You almost have to go for a whole genome sequencing approach. Um, in order to get appropriate depth of coverage, the cost of sequencing dramatically increases. So it's not necessarily, especially when you have a large N, whole genome sequencing is, is difficult. Now, if you believe that all of the alterations are most likely in coding regions, then using something like whole exome sequencing then will at least allow you to get the depth of coverage that's required to be able to detect them at a cost-effective approach because your costs significantly drop when you turn to whole exome sequencing. Um, I think one of the problems with the experimental design is, is that everything currently is mostly retrospective and a snapshot. And that's not, that's not reality, right? It's not a single time point that's going to be able to, to, to tell us all the things that we need to know. Um, so I think that, in general, that, that's, that, that is a limitation. Um, but certainly being able to capture and have the appropriate phenotype data that you're talking about and capture it in a controlled way that's consistent. So if somebody's seen by one clinician A and another clinician B, that they're going to record the exact same information for the same patient. And we know that that just is not, that just doesn't happen, um, which is unfortunate. So I think, um, you know, one of the things I've seen is in Epic, you can create what's called smart forms, which has really helped at Cedar sinai This has been a big focus of what we're doing out there. Um, and, and coming up, you know, working in, in groups and so forth is, is essential. I don't think I have a, a, an easy answer for that question because it, it's fairly complex. 
but certainly using things like minor allele frequencies and, and so forth can kind of help if it's common in the population then, you know, if it's not common in the population, you can use minor allele frequencies really come in handy. Um, if it is common in the population, they can also come in handy because you're probably not looking for something that's rare. Um, <coughs> using things like the Thousand Genomes database um, has certainly been a huge beneficial uh, benefit for me as well in these types of projects. <laughs> so, can I just comment on that? I, so, if you've got a group of genes that you're interested Um, you can do, you can just genotype those particular variants in the population, or you can do targeted sequences. Targeted sequences, which is something that we do at Moore, where you um, you generate, you, you just um, amplify that part of the genome. Absolutely, and that's what we're doing with this as well. We just partnered up with Washington University, Tanjuli. We're going to be using error corrected sequencing. Uh, the problem with some of the next generation sequencing. Um, applications such as whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing is that the ability to detect rare variants um, is, you just can't do it. You have to use something like error corrected sequencing, which is still next generation sequencing. It's just a type of next generation sequencing. Um, but a targeted approach can definitely, um, definitely help if you know the list of 16, 1600 genes that you're interested in. If you don't and you're still kind of fishing or you think there could be other com um, compounding or confounding you know, variants that haven't yet been reported, then you're back to doing whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. Um, and certainly this hasn't even touched on DNA methylation or um, any of those types of, you know, other types of alterations that can really, or differences in patterns that can really influence disease progression as well. <coughs> so these new variants that you, you found, mm -hmm. So what, what's a direct application? You know, I, mean, I guess you know, there is a direct application for treatment, but we also groups in the country we use the method that you uh, developed to diagnose this, uh, this children with this type of variant. Yeah. So our goal is so we're starting a um, clinical trial um, this year with 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 Andy and and and, and is, is one of the leads on it, and and that's sort of the goal is to use this in a a targeted approach. Um, with variants that are associated with treatment <coughs> options. Now, a lot of the variants we detected, there are no known compounds currently on the market. So although we're detecting them, it's not going to influence treatment options because <coughs> we're not connected yet to those in terms of treatment options. But we still think that those are really important. And if we don't report those, then how will pharmaceutical companies and people who are working on these diseases, you know, even know about them? So. Um, but for this particular study, we are taking a more targeted approach. We're going after about 100 genes of interest that are directly related to treatment options. Um, what I presented today was more of just sort of a basic research strategy for analyzing this type of data. Um, but certainly doing whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing um, at the clinical level is not very pra is not practical. You have to take a targeted approach. Um, and there's a lots of different reasons. Um, even from an ethical standpoint, what do you do when you detect an off-target mutation that's not related to the phenotype that you're studying? So let's say they have a, a, a BRCA1 mutation. What, what do you do with that type of information? So I think the targeted approach in the, in the clinical setting is definitely um, the way to go. And the clinical trial is going to start? Yeah, it's already started. Yeah. Great. How many patients are you planning to enroll? A thousand. So it's all over the country? Yeah, this is with the children's oncology. So let me come back to the FH question and go back and ask you about your thoughts on, on how it could affect um, therapy. So we have a new therapy uh, for hypercholesterolemia, CSK9 inhibitors, but it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, one way of, of approaching this, sort of the, the idiot approach, is assume everything is related to LDL cholesterol uh, and um, uh, uh, treat with statins so that's work, uh, use PCSK9 in, in um, so you have a couple of problems there. One problem is you don't know about effect on events 40 years later, from children 40 years later. Right. Um, Genomics may not be able to help with that in any kind of easy way because you still don't know about the events. Um, the other, the other uh, approach would be to try, and it's known in bats what the, what the target for therapy is, uh, 
Uh, and On the other hand, you have a pretty good phenotype. So how, would the, how can the genomics help here? Um, I think um, for drug resistance, um, those types of things, I think that genomics could really help. Um, and, and certainly, um, we've seen some examples of that, you know, especially in the pediatric AML where they gain mutations in PET2, um, which is associated with drug resistance, um, things like that. So I think, um, I'm not particularly sure what that particular disease cohort is drug, you know, you know, resistance to drug or treatment options is, is necessarily relevant, but um, relevant. I, I would, so that's one place where, um, but then again, this is a germline versus, yeah, I'd have to think about that. That's kind of a complex question. Um, and certainly, um, I, I really, I see a huge opportunity for proteomics nowadays as well, especially after being out at Cedar sinai um, And nowadays, you can sequence an entire proteome just like you can sequence the entire genome. And it's not, um, it's, it's actually about the same cost and, and so forth. The limitation is still the downstream binding somatic analysis. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, I think that's I think that's a it's a complex question to answer because it, it may not even be a genomic variant. It could be something that happens, you know, post translational modification that that is disrupted or things like that. Um, but I, I do think that genomics can certainly help with understanding, um, you know, drug resistance. Thank you very much. Right, thank you.